or the L100, as we all like to say, if, if we hadn't had that speaker, we not all, may not all be here working for JBL because it was such an important uh, product right. to the brand at that time. So it just made sense for us to, to celebrate the heritage. The timing was right. The market was getting introduced right. in, uh, or getting um, excited about retro style products. It's like, let's do it right. and we'll make them look old, but we'll make them sound great and we'll give them all right. the features and connectivity you want to have today. Happy listening from our sponsor, SVS. Acclaimed for punching well above their class, experience thrilling and immersive sound from SVS speakers, subwoofers, and cables. Join the sound revolution today. Visit svsound.com. Now on with the show. Welcome to the Acoustics Podcast. This is Brian Mitchell, and our special guest today is Jim Garrett, Senior Director of Product Strategy and Planning at the Luxury Audio Business at Harman International. Welcome to the podcast, Jim. Hey, thanks, Brian. Glad to be All here. Right. All right. Well, that that's a quite a long title. I kind of want to dissect <laughs> that title <laughs> and figure out what is your role at Harman Luxury Audio and uh, yeah, so I like to say my uh, title takes two business cards to cover it, but it's uh, uh, basically what I am in charge of is the roadmap product development of our BU. So everything that we develop under our brands within the luxury audio business unit, my team, which is all the product managers, uh, we're responsible for coming up with the concepts, you know, identifying the opportunities in the market, coming up with the concepts, defining the concepts. And then we work with the engineering team, program management, all our internal organizations in order to make those products a reality. And then we manage them throughout their life cycle as well. And you don't just do that for one brand. Could you go over all the brands that are part of this group? Yeah. So we have within Luxury Audio, we've got a number of brands that we manage uh, in their entirety. So within the Luxury Audio space, we have Mark Levinson, Arcam, JBL Synthesis, uh, Revel, and we do manage all of the JBL loudspeakers, not only all the premium ones, but we also do all of the mass market uh, products in terms of traditional component audio loudspeakers, like our stage series and things like that, that it, are really more mass retail prices. So despite the fact we're called luxury audio, we, we do cover those products. All right. So are you covering the Bluetooth speakers and that part of the JBL no. line that maybe people no, are no. popular with or the JBL headphones that are? People no, know those. Okay. Yeah. So JBL is the only brand that we share with other business units, but it's um, again, our portion of it is traditional component loudspeakers like box loudspeakers, architectural loudspeakers, but anything that's, you know, the Bluetooth speakers, sound bars, headphones, those things are all managed in uh, other business units right. outside of ours. And JBL has a history in the movie industry and in the movie theater and the studio. And that's also another part of JBL that's separate. Correct. Yeah. JBL Professional uh, has been separate from the consumer side of the business for decades now. Uh, we are co-located in the Northridge facility with the professional division. So there's a lot of shared technologies that we do on the acoustic side. So you'll okay. see components like compression drivers that are used in mm -hmm. our products that are also found in some of the JBL Professional products. But that's because our engineers are sitting next to their engineers. And so a lot of the technologies developed in our facility end up in both locations. But those types of products, whether you're talking about, you know, the MI uh, product, musical instrument, you know, pro audio stuff, uh, commercial cinema, permanent installations, stadiums, shopping malls, airports, those types of things. Those are all part of JBL Professional. You mentioned a, a key word in there, compression driver. And I don't think a lot of other brands use it at all, but you've innovated through decades of speaker design. Um, can you speak a little bit about the compression driver technology? Yeah, it certainly is a differentiation for us, uh, a bit of a better mousetrap, if you will. So it's a far more efficient type of driver. I think when you were here, we gave you a quick little uh, lunch and learn session on compression driver technology versus how that differs from a traditional, you know, right. dome tweeter type of high frequency driver. Uh, but again, it, it's far more efficient, you know, up to 10 times more efficient in terms of the energy that's coming out of it. Uh, but they're very difficult things to work with because the tolerances that are in 
in there are much, much tighter than what you would have a traditional dome type driver. Uh, they typically are going to get paired with some sort of waveguide or horn technology. And there's a lot of science that goes into doing those properly. And as you mentioned, for us, it's basically decades of research. Um, the evolutionary designs, revolutionary designs, and some of the newer stuff that we have. But we've been doing compression drivers since the birth of the company, really even with James Lansing was doing stuff before it was the JBL Corporation. So that technology goes back quite a ways. And again, it's, it's a, a point of differentiation for us ultra low distortion designs, we get uh, uh, dispersion control out of it. There's a lot of advantages that we get, uh, very high dynamics, um, greater power handling with compression drivers. There's, we we tend to use them in the majority of our products, but at the lower price points, there are still, due to the cost considerations of compression drivers, you'll still see that we use uh, some traditional dome type uh, drivers that are in some of the more affordable products on the lower end of the range. Right. Well, you did bring up some of the history. I don't think many people are aware of the history of JBL and how long it's been around. Um, can you speak a little bit about the heritage of the company? It actually predates JBL, as you mentioned. So James Lansing uh, was really there at the birth of sound and motion pictures. So when some of the first talking motion pictures, jazz singer uh, came out. So that was a design that was a number of engineers, um, Western Electric and uh, what eventually became Altec Lansing and whatnot after the fact uh, that developed that sound system. And so a lot of those guys that were engineers together uh, were separate entities, worked together at different times. And then uh, Jim eventually started his own company, James B. Lansing, um, which became ultimately JBL. Obviously, Altec Lansing at the time didn't want him really using the Lansing name in uh, his new corporation. So we were founded in 1946. Uh, so, you know, we've gone through most recently our 75th anniversary. We're two, three years beyond that now as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very rich history from the company, um, a lot of products, uh, a lot of industry first and standards and things that we've done throughout the history of the brand that is is uh, certainly separates us and is not the oldest, but one of the oldest audio companies still in existence. Well, I want to jump into the 70s because that's when JBL introduced the, the L100. Yep. On the consumer side, that is correct. It started off from the studio monitor side of the world. And we were really the leaders there in the late 60s, four track recording and things like that were out. When eight track recording came around, we needed a smaller studio monitor than what we had. 4320 uh, was the big one used at the time. And so we created a smaller one, the 4310, that was used uh, just again, because if you were tracking each channel, there was only so much space in the studio on a, 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 with right. the console. And that speaker, which was that original 12 inch three-way design that we see today in the L100 is really kind of how that came about. We found the recording engineers taking them home and using them as a home speaker. And so that's when they basically made a, a, a civilized version of it instead of the kind of rough gray paint that those things were, were in because it was just a, a, a tool for the studio. Then they right. ended up with a nice walnut wood veneer enclosure. So that was really around 1970-ish uh, that that speaker was introduced. And it was in production with several variants of it uh, as it was constantly improved. The same thing was right. happening on the pro side. 4310 became 4311, became 4312. Um, and L100 had a number of variants. Uh, the Century, probably the one that most people knew. But it was in production almost the entire decade of the 1970s. So then what happened through the 80s and 90s? The professional part was its own thing at that time. So we we had the split between JBL Consumer and JBL Professional. Uh, prior to that, it was really all just JBL. Um, mm -hmm. And so you saw then specific um, products that were being developed for the pro world, specific products for the consumer world. Um, we remained at that time, you know, JBL was really the leader in, in production uh, products. So the studio monitors that we built at that time, uh, throughout the late sixties, all through the seventies into the eighties, uh, the eighties is when we switched to compression drivers, really primarily for some of the, the main studio monitor speakers there. And so, um, the company then got to be very well known for a lot of products that we do. Um, I joined the company in 2010. So a lot of people that know our history, 
probably remember there was a group called Harman Specialty Group, which is where a lot of the premium brands uh, were found. If you look at the, specifically the brands that we manage, uh, a lot of those were part of Madrigal. And so Madrigal Audio Labs was an entity uh, that was prior to Harman acquiring a lot of those brands is where they lived. So um, that was like around 1995 when we acquired Mark Levinson uh, in its entirety and we really absorbed all that stuff into our group. Those things came together with lex Lexicon and JBL Synthesis that existed in a consumer world and that's what really created the Harman Specialty Group. And that's where you found Revel, Mark Levinson, Proceed for people that remember that brand. And then, um, as I mentioned, Synthesis got folded into this organization eventually too. And um, when I joined the company, that had uh, been in a process of being moved into our uh, pro division. And some people may remember we were briefly known as uh, the High Performance Audio Video Group, HPAV. Um, we had a big semi-trailer truck that we took around the country at that time that had a showcase of a JBL synthesis system on one side and a Revel Mark Levinson system in it. And we had a you know traveling road show. So that's when I joined. Um, and then around 2011, uh, under the current restructuring that we have uh, with the lifestyle division, we moved all these brands into the lifestyle division. So um, again, I've been here a little over, well, it was 13 years this month uh, that right. I've been with these brands. And uh, prior to that, I had actually sold them at retail. So we were a, a, a small shop in Indianapolis and we were a Mark Levinson dealer, a Proceed dealer, a Lexicon dealer. So I had a lot of experience, you know, back in the nineties when I was working at that shop on the retail side. Oh, interesting. So you actually sold the products and now you, you know, both sides of uh, I, how to deal with <laughs> how to deal exactly. with dealers and um, on the sales front, what they're looking for. Um, so what's fascinating is there are so many brands and they're at different price levels. So how do you, or uh, maybe the, the better question is how do they operate um, and how do you operate between them? Well, uh, they're not all the same things, of course. So there are differentiations between them. Yes, we do have two loudspeaker brands between JBL and Revel. Uh, they have very different approaches to what we do, but they're based on the same science and research that we do at Harman. But Revel, we tend to use uh, the dome tweeters with a waveguide approach. Most of the JBL products are compression drivers. Um, and there are different applications of what we do with the products. And, and JBL is a much broader portfolio of products that we have from that standpoint. On the electronic side, uh, Arcam is a hi-fi brand, and that's the more affordable part of what we do. And then that transitions naturally up into Mark Levinson, which is a more premium position brand in terms of price point and what we create from a product standpoint. Um, and then JBL Synthesis really kind of its own thing. So in Arcam, we obviously do multi-channel products. We make an amazing range of AVRs there too. But when you go into JBL Synthesis, that's all really our, our premium product for immersive audio solutions. It's products that were designed and engineered to work together as a complete system, rather than you have to go in and you know choose this, choose that, hope it all works together. We right. really develop it all on the basis of Harman's research and science. Uh, we have our own Harman target curve that we calibrate all the systems to at the end of the day. So that creates then uh, a premium solution for the immersive audio products. So. You can see how together uh, they work and kind of collectively go together. So we think of it, if you're a dealer that sells all of our brands, you know, how do we work together to maximize the ability to create systems, whether it was, you know, Arcam products with JBL or Revel speakers or, you know, Mark Levinson with Revel or JBL. Um, but uh, not all of our dealers, of course, carry all the brands. So we still look to how we align with the competition in any of those given categories. Well, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around how many products you're managing in the life cycle <laughs> simultaneously. <laughs> uh, a lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's one of the challenges is that we're managing five brands within this business unit and five brands worth of products. So it is a lot. Uh, it keeps us very busy from that standpoint. Uh, never a dull moment uh, at work. But, yeah, there, there's a lot to manage for sure. 
but it well, also I'm, I think from that standpoint too it it, it the challenge for our team is to create you know the right products the best products and not just creating things for the sake of creating them but we have to choose right. very wisely on what we're going to create and make sure that it's successful in the market well i'm fascinated where how does a product come to be at all like how much planning goes in and who and who eventually decides yes we're going to make it and how many get rejected along the way <laughs> yes <laughs> uh the fickle finger of fate uh so yeah we have uh, um a number of ideas that come up of course from the product team that's our job is to create these things look at the market identify opportunities that are there uh through where the market is going uh categories that are emerging uh places that we're not in but there's also the life cycle management part of it too so while there are incremental products that we could create over and above what we have in the collection, there's also the management of things that are aging out that need to be updated. So replacing things that are currently in production. So there's a combination of those two things that you have to do. Um, so you're doing the analysis. If you're replacing something, for example, you're going to do the analysis of what's worked, what's not worked, where's the competition move, where's the market, what consumers want, how has those things changed? And so how we can develop a, a replacement product that addresses those things. Things. If it's an incremental product category, it's similar things that we're still going to do in terms of market research and identifying the opportunity out there. Uh, but you're looking at things a little bit differently from the investment. At the end of the day, all of this is really creating a business case. You know, so for us as a product team, what we're basically doing is going and asking the company to give us a bunch of money to develop something and giving them a return on their investment. So uh, right. for us, you, you've got to have that business sense to put it together. How much is it going to cost to develop a product? How much are you going to make when it's said, you know, right. basically and what you're going to sell from a global forecast standpoint. So that's something that, that we have to do as part of that development. So there's an entire process that it goes through. It's not just, Hey, this is cool. Let's do it. You got to have that business case. It goes through a very regimented development process on our end. Uh, there are sign off all the way up to the executive levels of anything that gets created. So, yeah. Have any come? Have any come from you specifically, where you had the idea, and you had to and you had to pitch it and sell it? Yes, uh, a, a significant amount of them, because in my role, I am. That's ultimately my responsibility. So. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of products that have come from me, but ultimately still, it's not, I'm not a one man uh, team by any means. So why I may initially have the idea of this is something we could create. I'm going to engage uh, our team. Uh, we sit and have, uh, well, like we say, kind of product ideation sessions with the engineers. Mm -hmm. So I can sit down and say, hey, guys, this is something cool we should do you got to start to put the meat on the bone there. And that's where we'll sit with the engineers and say, okay, well, you know, the idea was that it would be this or that, but now how do we make that a reality and what can we really afford to do? What makes sense? Are there anything that we're not thinking of right now that could make it better? Right. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of that, but it is very much a, a, a team effort in that respect. So what are you most excited about right now? Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot. You know, a lot of uh, the products that were just announced back at our Harmon Explore event at CES this year, uh, mm -hmm. there's some really cool stuff there. Um, some of the things I'm super excited about, we can't talk about right now because they're not going to be announced until later this year. Um, we've got a few things that we'll show up with at the Munich show here in just a couple of weeks. So there'll be a few announcements there. Um, and then we've got things later this year that I think are super exciting. But again, I, I go back to uh, the things that we announced back in January, uh, that whole classic series of electronics, I think is super cool because it's really unique in the marketplace and it combines the retro design that, that's hot right now that people like, uh, but it gives you all of the modern connectivity and features that people would want to have in their products anyways. So I think that's uh, a cool uh, a range of products. The Powered speakers that we've been doing, uh, the ones that are, where are they? Right there, <laughs> those 4305Ps that are behind me. Um, we did the big brother to those, the 4329P. That's a phenomenal speaker. So um, I've, throughout my career, even prior to Harman, have developed some active loudspeakers. I think some of them were just um, 
we thought they were really cool when we created them, even at other companies I worked at, but it, it, it didn't seem the market was ready for it. And now, you know, it's taken 15, 20 years, but now we're to that point where it's there. So I, I think what you can do with a loudspeaker in terms of the performance you can get out of it, the connectivity and, you know, not have the complexity of putting all these components together is really cool on, on what we can do with active loudspeakers. And that 4329, uh, I think, is one of the best active loudspeakers on the market right now and really sits in a unique place because most of them are really smaller um like that product uh behind me the the five and a quarter inch there so this big monitor size eight inch uh sits in a unique space so i think that's really cool and lastly the bluetooth turntable that we announced uh, that's just cool too. So I'm a vinyl guy, despite the fact there are thousands of CDs uh, racked up behind me here. Uh, over okay. on that side, I've got uh, racks of vinyl sitting over there. So I think it's cool to see the younger generation getting interested in vinyl again. Right. You know, we've we've been digital files for so long. I love physical media. Uh, hmm. I'm a musician myself, but it, to me, it was always like you. You open the booklet and who played on it? Where was it recorded? What are the lyrics to the songs? You know, and and right. that kind of stuff. I think to see people getting into that and the ritual of you know, putting a a CD or an album onto a mechanical device to play it. Right, it's an interaction thing that's just very different than push play on a file or on your right. phone. So nice to see right. that happening. A couple of years ago, JBL reintroduced the classic series. We did. Um, uh, we introduced, we actually reintroduced the L100 first, um, uh, right before the 75th anniversary. And it was one of those things that historically going back, it was such an important product for the brand. It was such an iconic product. People remembered it from the Maxell blown away tape ads, if, mm -hmm. for, if dating, uh, aging myself there. But for those of us okay. that remember that campaign, it's still pretty well known. Uh, so for us, it was like it, we would always go to shows and events and you'd hear people talk about that speaker. You know, either I had him when I was in college or my dad had him when we were growing up. And that was their first memories of, you know, a, a good hi-fi system. So right. we brought the speaker back at that time um, and we wanted to stay true to its design heritage in terms of the retro look and finish of it. And, and that Quadrex foam grill was such a key piece of that. Um, so we did that and we said, well, hey, let's update the acoustics because obviously what we can do now is far better than what we did, you know, 50 years ago when it was first introduced. So that led then to 75th anniversary of the brands coming around. Let's do something cool. And so we decided, well, we'll do a limited edition version of the L100. And that's the idea of, of wrapping it in that beautiful teak wood veneer that we did. And we made a couple of changes and improvements to the speaker uh, to, to make it even more special. And then the scarcity of it, just because we only made 750 pair of them. Um, that was really made that a, a, a cool celebration for us for the 75th anniversary. Are they all sold out now? Or can uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine there's anybody that had any left because uh, they went pretty quickly. You know, it was all spoken for uh, mostly before it was built uh, and that obviously going to dealers. So to end right. users, probably not many of them around, but I, I know because we gave them all unique serial numbers. Uh, so there was, you know, pair one through 750. Um, and okay. they had the serial numbers on the plaques and they came in a custom wood crate. I'm sure that there are some collectors out there, some dealers that are sitting on a couple of pair in hopes of right. investment value for the future. <laughs> so, right. Well, you also came out with the L82, L52. These were smaller versions. Yep. Um, so. Yeah. I, so uh, the L100, if you go back to the 1970s, was... I guess you you call that a bookshelf speaker. Um, I don't Even though have it's a, quite large. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, quite I don't large. have a bookshelf that would support a speaker that big. Uh, but in terms of, if you compare that to like a, what a four stander is today, you know, most of these are these slim, you know, tall form right. factors, and this is very much a a large monitor, you know, big box type of speaker. So if in today's day and age. You know, it's it's too big to be a bookshelf. It's too short to be a floor stander. So it really needed to sit on a stand, which is why we created those dedicated stands for right. it. Um, 
And we knew that a lot of people really love the design, but it's big and maybe they couldn't afford the price point of what those were. So that's when we decided to scale it down. And while there was a you know direct predecessor to the L100, there wasn't necessarily to the L82. Yes, we'd made eight inch two ways before, but never a direct one in that series. So okay. when we created the L82, it was basically, let's shrink this thing down, uh, which is where we came up with the eight inch two way. Um, and outside of that, it retained the same aesthetics of the L100. And then the L52 was, well, because the L82 is still big, right? Right. Not really a, a bookshelf speaker. And we did develop a stand for it as well. Um, so then we created the L52 as the smallest version of it. So if you had Papa Bear, Mama Bear, <laughs> Baby Bear, now <laughs> you've got a really cool one uh, that truly is a modern day bookshelf size. You know, it's about the size of that 4305 behind me. So um, right. that then still gives you all the cool retro style. Very cool. Uh, acoustic performance is, is just off the charts on that little guy. So that for people, again, like the L100, too big, too expensive. Now you've got scaled down versions of it. And there's also something that keeps that same look called the L75 MS. Uh, this was developed. Um, another thing that we did as part of that 75th anniversary celebration, the idea was thinking again, modern consumers, uh, how do people listen to music? A lot of us are listening, you know, through phones, tablets, streaming services, things like that. Um, we wanted to create something that would be an all-in-one system. So the MS in the name stands for music system. The 75 came because we developed it as part of the 75th anniversary. So, and then all the classics start with L. And I don't know why they all start with L. I, I don't know the answer to that one, but we've kept it because that's what they used to do back in the 70s. So that's your secret decoder for the model name. Um, it, it, again, it, that is something that looks like the rest of the Classic Series family, but it's a fully integrated system. So it's powered. It's got our streaming engine in it. It's got a host of legacy connectivity in it. So it's really everything that you need all in one box. And we knew that people would not only use it for a music system, again, with a phone or a tablet, but that you could connect it to your television. So it's got an HDMI input on it. So you can have then audio for video. If you're doing, you know, apps through a smart television, that's one way to do it. Um, it's got a sound field expansion mode in it. So it does a very credible job of a very enveloping surround field when you do that. So if you're watching movies with it, um, it's kind of the step up from a sound bar in that standpoint. Uh, great, great sound, uh, plays loud, it's got great bass, does a, a convincing job of enveloping you with sound. Right. Um, but from the retro standpoint too, we put a phono input on it so you could connect a turntable to it if you wanted to, in addition to the Bluetooth mm -hmm. input and the digital inputs, HDMI and whatnot. And it's got a very um, classic series design to it. We actually went back the the curved front of it. You know, the rest of these things are, are flat fronts on them, but the L75, right. if, as you've seen, has a curved front on it. Mm -hmm. um, we did that partially because as an all-in-one stereo unit, the drivers are rather close together. So to get a convincing soundstage, um, splaying them apart, uh, it was something that helped in that respect. But we went back and looked at some of the products from the 50s and 60s that JBL had done. And at the time, the engineers called it built-in acoustics. But if you look at things like the Paragon, which is a, a famous JBL product from that time period, or the Metrogon, or they even made many guns at the time, um, they all had that curved front for the exact same reason, you know, it was to, to try to get a much bigger soundstage out of a, mm. a stereo configuration and a smaller box. So we took right. that, that curved front there, really inspired by the Paragon and, uh, put that here, splayed the drivers. And then it's, it does have the central, uh, mid range driver in it. But as you've heard, when you listen to it, it's a very oh, big right. soundstage <laughs> out of right. that product. So. No, I mean, for people that are just listening to the podcast, this looks like a oversized soundbar. It's a large, but it's curved. And I, and I, and I believe, like you said, it's the only curved JBL speaker right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where that came from. Um, a lot of people, you look, if you don't know what it is and you look at it and it's like, oh, is it, it's a center channel that goes with the L100s or no, it's its own self-contained music system. So it's really all you need. You don't have to have a separate amplifier, source players, or anything like that. 
you got this device, you can put it with your TV, you can put it on a sideboard, on a bookcase, someplace else, and that's your, your music system. Could you use it as a center channel or it's not really designed for that? No, it's not really designed yeah. for that. Um, I'm sure somebody could figure out some way to do it, but it was right. never intended to be that. Yeah. So that was one of the ideas of it, um, uh, how we could really pay homage to the history of the brand. Some of that came about uh, because we just went through a 70th anniversary celebration. Five years later, we did the 75th. And so that really just got a lot of us internally looking back. There's such a rich history of this brand. What are the cool high points where we could really pay homage back to those historical right. products and things that put us on the map. You know, the L100, as we all like to say, if, if we hadn't had that speaker, we not all, may not all be here working for JBL because it was such an important uh, product right. to the brand at that time. So it just made sense for us to, to celebrate the heritage. The timing was right. The market was getting introduced right. in, uh, or getting um, excited about retro style products. It's like, let's do it right. and we'll make them look old, but we'll make them sound great and we'll give them all right. the features and connectivity you want to have today. What do you think was so special about that speaker? Um, uh, the L100? Yeah, the L100. I, th I think uh, originally I, it was a great sounding speaker you know, because, again, it came out of a tool that was being used in the recording studios. Mm -hmm. So all of those albums and the you know pop music, rock music, everything that was being recorded there in the late 60s and throughout the 70s was really being in the studio mixed and mastered on those speakers so that was why you saw the engineers taking them home and using them because it was what they were hearing in the studio right so as the cliche marketing thing you know sound as the artist intended well there was no <laughs> better way to do it than this is right. the speaker they actually recorded it on so right. i think that was part of it and then um the design of the speaker was was very unique that original grill design was there um, they sold very well, you know, JBL at the time being the West Coast sound uh, mm. from an audio standpoint, is such a prominent brand in the 70s. Um, the, you know, it certainly didn't hurt anything that it became in the 80s with the Maxell tape ads, you know, that it became right. seen and known again. Um, uh, all of those yeah. things, I think, added up to, to making right. it such a special product. And there's also a new classic series of components that were also just announced coming out either now or, or very soon, right? Yeah. Uh, so part of that, if we go back to that 75th anniversary, one mm -hmm. of the things that we did was create a matching amplifier uh, that was a unique product that we built. Um, I, I'm a, by nature, a historian. Uh, it, to me, you know, knowing where you came from is is very important to the context of where you're at today. And so I love that stuff. I'm kind of known as one of the company historians. Uh, there's a couple of us that really know in depth the history and products and things like that. But I was in um, Japan on a business trip over there, and we were at one of the dealers that specialized in vintage gear. And I knew about this product, of course, but JBL in the 60s did make a line of electronics. They made an integrated amplifier and this EQ and some power amps and some other things that were there. And one of them, uh, well, two of them, the SA600 and the SA660 that were basically integrated amplifiers of the time. And um, they had one there, the earlier version, it was this brushed silver front panel and cool retro knobs and switch gear on it. But it's decidedly you know, 60 year old technology in terms of performance. Right. But we took that as the design inspiration. It's like, what if we made an amplifier that looked like this thing did, but it was a modern amplifier in terms of its power. It was a modern amplifier in terms of inputs and connectivity and high res DACs and things like that with it. And that's what uh, the SA750 that we created really came from that. And it was originally intended to just be an anniversary amplifier and it was something that we knew was a great pairing to go with those uh anniversary l100s that we had created the classic 75s so um that's where it started and we thought we'll make a few of them we didn't do a specific number of them like we did the speakers but we said we'll just have it in production for the anniversary and then go from there well it turned out to be a popular piece and we decided well hey we could keep this in line but as we looked at the fact that we had expanded the classic series loudspeakers, it was too expensive to really go with most of the rest of the speakers. 
Um, but as we looked at it and said, well, the idea of retro looking electronics with modern connectivity is a good one. Let's create an entire range of products. And that's what we announced back in January. Uh, second amplifier, two digital sources, a turntable that are all part of this classic series. So they all look like 1960s era uh, right. JBL products or really early 70s as well. Um, but they have very modern features, performance, connectivity, those types of things to go with them. And I like to say they're more right-sized in terms of the price points to go with things like the L82 and the L52 now that we have those smaller, more affordable speakers in the range. Yeah, I think I have some of the prices. The SA550 is a step-down classic series integrated amp from the yeah. 750. Yep. And that one is 2000 if I yes. have numbers right. Then there's a CD350 classic CD player, yep. uh, which is 700. There's an MP350 classic streamer for music streaming yep. uh, at 800. And a classic turntable, the TT350 um, at 1000. 1000, correct. Yep. Okay. So for a complete retro vintage looking system you can get everything from jbl yeah and for us now again with the speakers you got this unique retro look and then you put it with right. this modern looking black amplifier it just doesn't look that good um and we, we knew the appetite was there from the sa750 so the SA750 is remains in the range now. We got rid of the teak side panels we had for the anniversary, and we just put the walnut side panels on it that match the loudspeakers. But that's $3,300, so it's far more expensive than the SA550 is. So the 550 doesn't have the streaming capability in it, but it has high-res Bluetooth connectivity. So you can still stream to it if you wanted to, and still a okay. G-class uh, amplifier in it back to physical media younger generations that didn't grow up with it that are experiencing it people that have realized now that with the streaming service i don't really own the content i'm leasing it mm -hmm. and if that right. streaming service goes away so does my music so there's an ownership element of it too but that's where we we put that uh back into play and said well there, it's there's still a very robust market for a cd player um and there's still simply people as is evidence behind me, if you have a large CD collection um, and the players may be on their last right. legs, there's that customer looking for a replacement. Uh, the streamer is a, a, a bit of a unique one because if you think about people that have systems based around vintage gear, um, to bring a modern streamer in is a you know completely out of its element in that system. Right. Uh, for a lot of these shows and events that we've had this at right now, we're getting feedback from customers that are saying, I'm so glad there's a product like this out there now where I can have access to high res streaming audio, but it still looks like the vintage gear that my mm. system's based around right now. So I think that's gonna be a cool thing there. And then the, the turntable, of course, just that just kind of makes sense. We made a turntable that looked like a 1960s, 70s turntable um that was just kind of a, a no-brainer for us in that respect um and then you also brought out another turntable a bluetooth turntable this one isn't quite vintage but can we speak about that one i it's it, yeah it's 180 degrees away from it it's a very modern player uh um and this again goes back to just seeing how people were interested in vinyl younger generations um, I've told the story before my, uh, niece was going to college and she was going to live in the dorm and she had a JBL pulse, uh, which is the one with the lights in it, a Bluetooth mm -hmm. speaker, a little portable Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. And that's her system. And she was going to have that in her dorm room, but she was very interested in vinyl and said, I, you know, we're like, what do you want for Christmas? I want a turntable. Okay. That's cool. You know, she, I don't know what she was 18, I guess at the time when she was going to school. And so my wife and I said, well, let's buy her a turntable. And so we went and looked on the market and what was out there, uh, bought her one, sent it to her, and she loves it. And she paired it with her pulse, and that was her system. So she mm -hmm. had the vinyl stuff that she loved and being able to, to have records and whatnot, but she played right. it through this cool Bluetooth speaker. Um, so we came up with the idea of, hey, well, let's give a turntable that's got that same type of connectivity. But what we didn't want it to be was a plastic toy turntable we wanted this to be you know experience the rich sound of vinyl with a, a serious turntable 
So the challenge uh, that we put before the team was we got to create something that is a high quality turntable that just happens to have high resolution wireless connectivity to it so that you could use it with anything. Um, you know, you could use the, the Spinner BT could be used with a set of headphones like this. You could put it to a portable speaker like my niece has done. Um, you could pair it to a sound bar. We know one of the things, a lot of people that use sound bars, there's a very high percentage. I can't remember the research was like 60, 70% of people that use the sound bar to listen to music without their television being turned on. Because mm -hmm. if you live in an apartment or a smaller space, that's probably the only audio system that you have there. And because right. they all have Bluetooth now, you can pair your phone and stream your music or you stream through the smart apps in your television. So right. um, this turntable can now connect to the sound bar. So it gave us a variety of ways to do it. Um, we demonstrated it at uh, Vegas at our show with our party box speakers. You know, mm -hmm. that's uh, if you've seen our, our portable Bluetooth speakers, but they have all the light shows and things on them. We made a very small one that's battery powered. And we said, this is a way you could have sound in your house because you can pair two of them together and mm -hmm. have stereo sound. And then if you want to take the music outdoors, grab the speakers and take them outdoors because they're connected right. to the to the turntable still, but it's battery powered. So that was something there um, <clears throat> that I think had a very unique use case. Again, did not make it a toy. It's a, it's a wooden chassis. It's an aluminum tone arm. It's got a high-end cartridge on it, aluminum platter. We did all the things to make it a real turntable. Uh, the Bluetooth is high res, Aptex HD on it. So, and it's got, if you're not using Bluetooth, it's got a phono preamp built into it. Uh, which you can defeat if you've got a phono input on your amplifier, but it's just a, a high quality turntable at an affordable price so that we could get as many people out there as possible to be in love with vinyl and experience the sound of vinyl. Three ninety nine dollars uh, price point on that, yes. Those two turntables, I uh, will clarify if anyone's out there looking for, oh, that sounds cool, I'd like to buy one. Both of those are going to be available in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, mm -hmm. Those other products that we just discussed, the CD, the streamer, and the amplifier, those are going into production um, here in just a couple of weeks. So those will be available in the summer uh, at retailers. And the classic series speakers, um, I know there was a, a limited edition run, but there was also a black series that came out. I don't know if that's still in production or if those are going to be reintroduced. Uh, yeah, so those are in production. We announced those at the end of last year. That was another one, um, talking with some customers out there that people just, they love the sound of the L100. They liked what it was. But if you think about this, the decor of your home, this old school walnut finish and, and, you know, we offer it in black, orange, and blue grills. That grill is a, a huge statement on that speaker. You may say, well, that, you know, that's super cool, but that does not match my decor. Um, mm -hmm. And we we had a lot of, of uh, more contemporary homes that would said, you know, it'd be really cool if it looked different. So we created the black editions, which are we we basically said we dressed the speakers up for a night on the town. So we got them in there, you know, black tuxedos. Uh, so we switched out the walnut wood veneer for a high gloss, you know, piano black finish on them. Um, we we took the uh, the Henry Ford approach on the grill, any color you want, as long as it's black. Uh, so uh, and then we switched out the logos on the front it has a gold JBL logo. The um, labels around the attenuators is special gold, uh, and then on the back above the inputs as well. So that was something that then gave them a very sophisticated, very modern appearance to uh, what was in its other guys a decidedly retro speaker. And we did it on um, all three of the passive speakers, and we did it on the L75 that we discussed a minute ago. The L82 and the L100, so I called, I'm a car guy, so I, I called that the appearance package, the Black Edition <laughs> appearance package, which was everything I just mentioned to you. Right. We did on the L82 and L100, we called it the performance package. So those two speakers, we... Um, improved the drivers. We made some evolutionary um, improvements to the drivers, the tweeter, the woofer, whatnot. Uh, we revised the crossover networks in them and we gave them uh, by wire input cups with premium binding posts on the back of them. So they had that as a step up from the normal L82 and L100 as well. Um, mm. So those products are, are very, very cool. Again, um, just most recently at the Expona show, they are available at dealers now. Uh, so if you're interested in, in that product, 
it's a very different looking speaker than the, the L100, but it's still, it's an L100. And if you want to match them up to the classic series components, those are coming out um, this, this Q4. Uh, so they, they began the, the, Products we announced in January, they're going into production just here in a couple of weeks. So those will be rolling out to dealers. I would expect you'll see them here in the U.S. Okay. Uh, dealers should probably have them the June, July time frame, depending on when they're where their orders are in the system. And you did bring up something I just want to clarify. I thought you said that the Black Edition Classic Series are slightly different or upgraded versions of the of the 75th anniversary models that came out a couple of years ago. N no, actually, uh, it's a good point that you bring up. So the normal L100, um, mm. that version of the speaker with the walnut veneer and the and the tricep grill colors on it, that version, when we did the 75th, all of these, what I call the performance pack features are what we created for the 75th anniversary. So okay. a black edition... L100, if you're following along with the home game, a <laughs> black edition L100 is acoustically the same as the 75th anniversary L100, but mm. both of those speakers have improvements over a standard L100. So, okay. So there's a standard L100, and then there's 75th anniversary step up, and the black edition is the same as the 75th in terms of acoustic performance, but if you go in terms of how the speakers would have ranked, the 75th one is still kind of the cream of the crop because of its unique appearance and this uh, mm. special serialization of them. And they were sold only as a package with the stands and came in a wood crate and everything out there. So that's the, the most special version of it. And so if you couldn't get your hands on that, or you didn't like the look of that speaker, the black edition will get you the sound of that speaker, but right. it doesn't have the same exclusivity of the limited edition 75th anniversary. It, it, again, if you can find one of those, I think they're pretty much all gone now. But Right. And for people that can't wait for the new electronics to come out, what type of amplifiers would you recommend pairing with those? Um, well... Selfishly, I would recommend if you're not going to wait for those JBL amplifiers, I would suggest the Arcam amplifiers. <laughs> uh, great pairing, and we make the right price points to match the appropriate size uh, amplifier to go with each of the speakers, whether it's the L52 all the way up to the L100. Uh, so in that range of the current products, um, you could do the SA10, the SA20, the SA30. Those amplifiers would be great pairings to go with uh, our Classic Series loudspeakers. To touch on what's behind you and switch to more of a studio industrial look is the 4305P and the 4329P. I think I got those models right. Um, you got I still want to know why they start with four. If there's another reason, <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. Um, but as those numbers go up, the speakers get larger is my understanding. Um, but these are uh, more industrial looking speakers completely different but they're these are a, a all-in-one solution where the Correct. amp is built in the wireless is built in you can bluetooth stream to them or plug them into your home internet is that exactly yeah this so uh, there's two things happening there there's the studio monitor side of it so mm touch on that for a moment okay. that comes back to that history 43 20 43 10 that was there in the studios and then as we moved into the biradial horn compression driver speakers in the 80s and whatnot um that studio monitor range when pro and consumer kind of split off mm -hmm. a lot of those um the speakers that were in the eighties that we had on this pro studio monitor, they all had this blue baffle and the exposed drivers and things like that. So they had a very distinct look and they all came in a walnut wood veneer cabinet. And so as we continue to make speakers on the consumer side under the studio monitor series name, we kept those design elements. So if I were to remove the grill off that, you'd see a blue baffle behind the grill. Um, and we do offer it in a natural walnut version that comes with a blue grill that looks like those 80s uh, speakers. So that series, we continue to make a number of passive products. So today, um, a lot of listeners may know the 4367, which is the flagship. 4349 um, is the 12-inch two-way that we introduced uh, two, three years ago now. 
and then a baby 4309. So you got the big 15 inch two way, a 12 inch two way, and a six and a half inch two way that are all passive speakers. Um, when we wanted to get into the active series uh, speaker range, we took a look at the studio monitors because they're some of our best selling loudspeakers around the world. And we said, well, let's do it in that range because it would also give us the advantage of the compression driver technology that we currently use. When we redid that range a few years ago, we kept that again, that older look, but we updated all the drivers. So today, 4309, 4349, 4367, they all use our most advanced compression drivers and most advanced horn geometry and whatnot. So we said, that's the perfect platform to make a fully active loudspeaker out of because we knew we could come up with performance that just nobody else could touch in the category. So that's where the idea started. And because it's an active speaker, our engineers, it's a closed loop design. So our engineers could optimize the driver to the amplifier because you know exactly what is driving it. In a passive loudspeaker design, you've got this element of uncertainty if you don't really know what that particular customer is gonna connect it to. So right. there's only so much that you can do in terms of, of the performance. So that's what's great about uh, active loudspeakers and what we created with these little guys. I just wanna clarify real quickly. So the classic series does not use compression driver. Mm -mm. I'm choosing a different kind of tweeter. If you want the compression driver technology, you have to go to the studio, studio series. Mode. Yep. Okay. Yeah, all the classics use a, um, a one inch or a three quarter inch metal dome tweeter. And we put that with an acoustic lens and a waveguide. Um, which is a little more true to what we did back in the day, but still radically improved over back in the day on those speakers. The studio monitors, we've been using uh, compression drivers on them for a number of years now. And so it is a, a significant step up in terms of performance uh, with these drivers uh, versus the classics. But these tend to be more expensive relatively than the uh, classics are as well. So what are some of the price points then of the studio series so uh, actually the one behind me now uh that's the smallest guy in the range so those three passives that we had we started at two thousand a pair for the 4309 mm -hmm. which is a six inch uh two-way passive speaker um these guys behind me are 2200 a pair uh it's a five and a quarter but it's fully active design and we can dig into the features of connectivity in a minute um but that's where those are at. And then the next step up you're going to go to would be the 4329, which is the larger version of this that's at 4,500. Then you go to the 4349, which is 8,250. And then the 4367, which is a flagship, those are 16,500 a pair. So these go up considerably higher in price than the uh, classic series. Uh, they go up higher, but they build in the amplifier and the streaming technology. In some in some of the cases, <laughs> in uh, two in of the, the five, yeah. In so the active cases, if you yeah. see the P on the model name, that means powered. powered. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, there's five models in the uh, studio monitor range right now. So we have three passive and we have two active, and they mm. they kind of align. So you, in terms of the price and the size on them, can you connect the spinner Bluetooth turntable to those? Speakers to yes. really have an all-in-one, very yep. uh, almost no wire solution, right? Yeah. I, what's what I like about these is again for a modern consumer, the cool thing about these, you buy them, you take them home, get them out of the box, plug them into the wall, get them on your network, and you got music. So you, you're mm -hmm. not buying an amplifier and different source players and what cables do I need to connect it all? Um, it's just a simple plug-and-play process. Um, you can still connect other devices to them. So these have a variety of, of physical connections on them that you can put things to and some unique ones. But in the case of the Spinner BT, I could pair it via Bluetooth to the speaker. Um, I could use the line level output. Uh, these do not have a phono input on them, but the Spinner BT has a phono preamp built in. Mm. So if I engage that phono preamp, I could send a line level signal and hardwire to a pair of these active speakers, either these are the bigger ones um, or wirelessly via Bluetooth. That's pretty much everything you need in a system right there. I could stream high-res music. I could play vinyl off of it. Mm. It's There's your whole hi-fi system and you basically got a pair of speakers on a turntable. How do you describe how the sound difference is between the studio series and the classic series? 
Well, they sound certainly all like JBL uh, because we go after the Harman target curve in terms of the tuning. The capabilities of the drivers and the studio monitors are more, they're more capable, more advanced drivers. And with a compression driver, um, lower distortion, greater dynamic capability, higher output capability. Um, also with the price points that are in those speakers um, on the low frequency side, you can get more bass out of them because they're you know, more advanced, more expensive uh, woofers that are in those products as well. And bigger cabinets with <laughs> tuned ports too. So I feel like it's an underrated story that the history of JBL, the research and development that goes into every product isn't because you have so many products and it's hard to give that story um, when you have a thousand different products. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> the, the, true. Uh, and fair point. So, I, and for us, you know, we probably, the products that we do in our business unit are the most like historically the, the other products that we've done. So for us, right. it's just decades of development and, and all the research that we do corporately that we can utilize and build upon. Um, I, I know many people know uh, our corporate research team, Harmon X that's there, uh, Dr. Sean Olive and Todd Welty and some of these guys that have written a lot of papers for AES and a lot of the research and things that we've done at Harmon, we share it with the industry. So a lot mm -hmm. of that research has now become industry standards that are out there. And you think about, um, you know, you see a lot of people talking about target curves these days, not only for right. what we do with in-room loudspeakers, but there's a different target curve that's needed uh, for headphones. And that's a, a story we told about these. The, uh, I'll be remiss if I don't put my marketing hat on. The the lovely uh, JBL or Mark Levinson Mark. number 5909 headphones. Yep. Um, so um, that's a different transfer function to get these transducers into your ear. So it was required a different curve. But again, all of the same research that we've done and the Harman X team has done uh, for listener preferences, subjective and objective measurements, <clears throat> All of that is research that we can bring to bear. It was it was our North Star when we developed these headphones. We wanted that target curve and and to create the best sounding headphone that we thought was available on the market. So we did that with these. But back to the JBL side of it, it's that same sort of research that we can build upon uh, on our loudspeakers and a lot of the things that we do in testing and development. So. Uh, the anechoic chambers that we have that the guys can use to measure transducers and completed systems, uh, clipo measurement systems that we can do to analyze the drivers themselves, power testing that we do. You heard the stories when we were there. Uh, you mm -hmm. smelled burnt voice coils when you're in that room. Right. Um, and we talk about how we can iteratively develop a driver when we know it's failure points. So the guys can put it in there, test them to their death. Uh, we'll have a brief ceremony in honor of the dearly departed. And then we'll, we'll, chop it apart and look at it and go, okay, what failed and how do we make that better? Um, which certainly is a performance aspect of it, but it's also a quality and reliability aspect too, that we know these things are investments. You don't want them to fail, you want them to live. And certainly when you're talking more expensive loudspeakers, these things become generational things or heirloom type products where you know, you see people that have like, I've got this 40 year old pair of speakers that belong to my dad and we still use them in my system. So those are things that you want them to last a long time. And mm -hmm. that uh, power testing and, and testing to destruction is one method to right. do that. Well, that brings up the warranty. Most of the stuff that we do in the U.S. is a five-year uh, labor on a passive or parts and labor on a passive products. On active products, it's it can often be and typically is like a one-year in terms of the electronics part of it. Um, but you would, of course, go first and foremost to the dealer that you purchased the product from to get it serviced. But we've got service centers throughout the United States. Uh, where products can be sent to repair um, products that have have aged out you know there's so many uh, products that are still around that they're that old of course we don't make <laughs> components for a product that was built in the 60s but there is a uh, there's a robust market out there of people that do you know reconing services or things like that or vintage people that have hoarded drivers over the years that have may have some parts and components available for you there um, there are companies that have done um, reproductions of parts and components that are out there. So um, that's ways that some of those things will stay around and stay functioning for many more years to come. I did want to talk about the headphones on your head, the Mark Levinson 5909. The They are $1,000 wireless Bluetooth 
headphones. They're one of the most expensive ones on the market. You know, Mark Levinson is our premium electronics brand. Um, that's a brand that was founded in 1972, has really been considered one of the industry uh, standards for performance throughout its 50-plus uh, year heritage there. Um, that is mostly a component audio brand, but a couple of uh, years ago, we developed the headphones that are on my head. And mm -hmm. our idea there was to really make the best wireless headphone uh, that we we could create. The advantage for us, you know, where it's like luxury audio, we're not the headphones. Be There's a whole other business unit in Harman that develops all of our headphones for mm -hmm. all the brands that they do. Um, so for us... Um, we took a, a slightly different approach uh, to how we were going to create these, um, and we were going after a very different market than um, the majority of headphones that Harman does right now. As you mentioned, they're much, much more expensive. We wanted to do something that was commensurate with the brand and needed to look and feel and uh, have that luxurious experience that you would expect from a Mark Levinson product. Um, so there were two aspects. W one of it was the, the design of the sound um, we wanted to bring to bear all of that corporate research that we have from Sean's team and Todd's team that they've mm -hmm. done all this research into headphones. Um, so we use that as kind of the, the guiding North Star for how to get the sound there. And then the other part of it was the materials, the fit and the finish. Um, as a luxury headphone, travel headphone, um, we wanted to make sure all of the materials, the accessories, everything that you got with the headphone was very much commensurate with the price point of the product uh, mm -hmm. and the expectations of what you would have with that. Um, we knew too, that there was a market out there. You know, people, when we first started telling people the price point of these, they're like, you guys are nuts. Who's going to pay a thousand dollars for a wireless headphone? Well, we knew there was a market opportunity out there of, of people that wanted a wireless ANC headphone, but there wasn't anything out there that they felt was of the caliber of what they really wanted to have because it was all just kind of lower price products at the time. Um, and so again, everything about it, the carrying case, the accessories that came with it all spoke to that, the materials, you know, there's no real plastic on the, the, the yoke and the headband and everything is right. aluminum. Uh, the leather material that we used for the cups and for the headband, um, the automotive grade paint that's on them uh right. metal details so everything very premium in that respect uh made for a very different product and now what you've seen is you said we are no longer the most expensive headphone on the market because several other brands have come out and uh one upped us in that respect and said oh there is a market to be had there uh let's go out and and uh, explore see what could be done for that standpoint but these have been a huge success for us uh really awesome hit set of headphones i travel around the world with them uh, exactly mm. the way we intended them to be. So on, you know, international flights, using these to watch movies, listen to music, um, right. as a glasses wear, they're still very comfortable. And so mm. you can keep these things on for hours at a time and, and not get that, you know, vice, uh, sort of head feel from a high clamping force or anything like that. The ANC is top notch in these, so you don't right. hear anything. Um, it's, Great. And I, I would point out too a unique aspect of this. Of course, I am using them with a cable right now. These aren't turned on right now. They're completely shut down. The batteries aren't even on right now. So I'm using them in a passive mode connected to the computer uh, through a cable right now. So it does make them actually a, a very nice uh, headphone to use with a home hi-fi system if you wanted to use it that way too. How did all these brands come together? I One of the interesting things, you know, we talk about our brands and we can easily look at these and, you know, from a, just from a pure price point, uh, where do they sit? Um, our cam may be one of the more affordable brands for us within the luxury audio business unit. Uh, Cause we've got products that, you know, are a few hundred bucks all the way up to a couple thousand bucks, but they, we're not super high end. And then that leads into Mark Levinson. Mark Levinson, we make some, you know, very expensive products. We just did our anniversary amplifier, the ML fifties, and those were 50,000 a pair for those monoblock amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So that's there. Uh, our Revel speakers, you know, we go up right now, the F three, two, eight BE, which is our flagship speaker in the Revel range. Those are around 17, 18,000 a pair in the U S. So these things are obviously far more expensive than what a lot of consumers know the JBL brand for today, which is, our amazing range of sound bars, uh, uh, industry-leading headphone and portable Bluetooth speakers, 
that we sell a lot of those products and that's what a lot of people know the brand for today with just some truly fantastic products in that space but they are much more affordable you know you can buy a a flip or a charge or a pulse all those portable bluetooth speakers that are you know a couple hundred bucks and don't realize we still make some amazing loudspeakers you know and and that's the part of the brand that we manage so if you're in our series we talked about studio monitors we talked about classic series a lot of people are familiar with our hdi series of loudspeakers which is a tremendous range of speakers that we have and those top out about 5500 a pair for the hdi 3800 but people i think often overlook the fact that the most expensive products we make at Harmon are jbl we mm -hmm. still do our k2 and our everest loudspeakers you know and a, a pair of everest today in one of the premium finishes is ninety nine thousand dollars a pair so mm. the most expensive things we make are actually under the jbl brand um but i think people look at it as you know the mark levinson and the others are the the, the premium brands in that respect so well also along the jbl brand moving up in price is jbl synthesis yes. which is a home theater premium line um, well, it's a completely different story. So JBL mm. Synthesis was, was created in the 90s as a solution where we looked at what we were doing on the uh, cinema side of the business and also on um, post-production sound work, you know. Um, so people that were creating the content for television and motion pictures were using our products on that side. That's one of the cool things about JBL is it's, it's found throughout all aspects of the chain from content creation to content playback and whether that was the products used in a recording studio or a post-production studio to products that are used in your local cinema plex when you go to see a movie to products when you're going to a concert event or any live right. sound event it's all jbl and so we were pervasive throughout sound in that respect but the the synthesis brand again came from kind of the Hollywood set where these guys that were creating the content wanted a playback system at home that was commensurate with what they would have from their cinema or how their art that they were creating was going to be played for the consumer. And that's really where it came about. So it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's, we don't really sell products per se in JBL synthesis. It's really system solutions. So mm. it's, it's a product where we do the, the, surround processor or AVR, we do the amplification, we do the loudspeakers, um, we do the EQ to our target curve. So all of that is is around that complete system. If you're talking mm -hmm. the cinema world, that'd be the B chain. So it's everything except the video portion of it. So um, th that's been around for quite some time. We do scale those systems and we've recently been expanding the brand we had a reputation that was out there. It's like, oh yeah, JBL synthesis. I've heard one of those. That's the most amazing thing I've heard, but I can't afford it. They're super crazy expensive. Well, the reality of it was twofold. Yes, it was a higher price point that we knew maybe not everybody could afford, but we also had a lot of high-end integrators that were like, mm, yeah, that isn't remotely close to as expensive or as big and as capable as some of these systems I do where we're using pro gear or anything else like that. So we've really expanded the brand lately in two directions. We've gone upscale with our reference products, the SEL1, SSW1 loudspeakers we launched recently. And we've gone with uh, a range of in-wall and ceiling speakers, SEL567 and 8, mm. and our AVR that have allowed us to scale uh, to more affordable price points too. So ultimately we just feel that synthesis is, is the best immersive audio systems available on the market right now. And, uh, we scale those to exactly your needs as a consumer or what type of system, how big the room, what you're going to use that for in your home. I like how you explain synthesis as a solution, not a product. So as, as people think about building out a custom home theater, what price points are they looking at if they want JBL synthesis? I think, first of all, what you're really looking for is the experience. I don't think anybody necessarily, maybe initially you go in and go, I've got, you know, $40,000. We're going to create this, you know, incredible cinema room in our home. I don't know that a lot of people do that. They What they really mm. know is I want this experience at home for mm. myself, my family, my friends. Um, and it's it, the pandemic uh, in that respect, 
you know, a lot of people were certainly looking to invest in this space because you couldn't go to those types of events. You couldn't go to sporting events, couldn't go to concerts, you, you know? Right. So those types of things people wanted to, to have in their home. So I think that's really what you're looking to do. What are, what are you going to do with the system? We watch, you know, concerts on it. We watch movies on it. The kids are going to game on it. Um, right. And so you start at that. And then we take a look certainly at the space that it's going to go in. That's a key part of this. What is the room environment? Um, how do we get the most immersive sound in there? That'll affect the channel count of what we do. Um, and again, we now have the products that allow us to scale. So you could take, certainly price is going to come into consideration at that point. They're, you can afford something, you may not be able to afford something else, but we can still get you the best possible performance at that particular price point uh, in that particular space based on, you know, how we have those discussions with the client up front. So it's more of a custom solution where you talk to the client and you figure out their room size. And if they decide they want seven speakers or 15, then obviously that's going to increase the price, <laughs> but you, um, you, you figure it out based on the room size and you do all the measurements. And that was the other thing that I found fascinating is this is not just you buy it and set it up yourself. Like when you're buying, this system through a JBL synthesis integrator, they're calibrating the entire thing for you. Correct. And that's a key part that you mentioned there. You know, this is something that clients going to go to their local integrator with the need. They're going to help evaluate and determine what's there. Often a customer doesn't know. They don't know channel count or understand it. I don't know what a, you know, 7.1.4 system is, let alone any of these other crazy channel counts that we get into. They just know, again, the experience of what they're looking to have. So mm. it's really up to the integrator, our integrator partner, then to help determine what's the best possible solution for the room um, and determine the number of speakers that are going to be necessary to achieve that level of performance. Um, you can still, with the scale of the price points and everything, I could still have higher channel count systems that aren't crazy expensive, depending on the products that we use in that particular room. But that partnership with the integrator is a, is a key piece of this. Um, we just actually, as part of JBL Synthesis, uh, introduced a certified systems program last year. And that's one of the things that we do is that one of the things to experience uh, a system is for the integrator to have one that a customer could come here and mm -hmm. you could say, well, I'm a synthesis guy. And it's like, great. Can I, I, I can I come here one? Well, no, but I'll create one for you. It's like, well, so for the partners that are making that investment to have a system on display, they've made the investment in terms of being experts at, at designing and specifying the systems up front. that certified systems program, goes towards them as well. So that as a consumer, you know uh, that this guy is capable of the highest level of, of specification, installation, calibration, and after the sale support. Um, it also, on the system side of it, kind of gives them that, that guarantee as a customer that you've got a level of performance that was certified by the factory. It meets our, our specification and our expectation for system right. performance. So. That's that's another way to help separate those people and uh, those dealers uh, are denoted on the uh, dealer locator on a website as well, too. As you've seen and heard, we have a reference JBL synthesis system on the Northridge campus, the John Ergel Theater, um, mm. which we use as a showcase. But it's actually available for clients to come in and wow. uh, see and hear that. We've done that in partnership with the uh, companies that work together with us to create that room in the first place. Um, so they will have customers that want to see their gear in that, the projection system, the, you know, the uh, interior design of that room that were done right. in, in conjunction with those partners. They'll, they'll bring some of their clients out as well too. And it's an easy place to get to, you know, uh, coming into LAX or coming into the Van Nuys airport and they can get over and see and hear this one. I'm afraid to ask this, but I've been there and I got the demo from the John Ergel Theater and you said it's open to the public. So I'm a little worried how many people well, are going to be I able to get yeah, demo. I, I would not say that it's open to the public. I say it's available for demonstrations for clients that are coming in through partnerships with uh, our retailers. 
So okay. obviously, uh, it's not a you can't just come up to the front door and come in and get a demo. So these are things that are scheduled by appointment only, specifically mm. with uh, those particular integrators. Um, it's outside of our lab facility, so it's near the lobby of the thank you for clarifying that because i certainly didn't mean to uh, imply by any means that it's like come on down demos anytime you want it we got a popcorn machine we're good to go uh because that uh, is not the case um but it but uh again we'll, we'll we do have people that have come out to have a listen to that system uh well i certainly want to recommend if you are interested in jbl synthesis to try to get an appointment through your local dealer to hear this system because it is I think it's, um, you're gonna have to clarify me on the number of channels, like 13 point something point 13. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 13.4.13 is what that particular room is, yeah. All right. So 13 lower level channels, four dedicated sub channels. There's more subs than four, but four channels of subs. And then 13 um, height channels, elevation or height channels up top. So uh, yeah, I highly recommend um, if you're interested in home theater to um, find a way to hear this room and see if you can replicate this in your own home or environment. Um, Cause the JBL synthesis line is something uh, unique that um, is quite, it's quite worthy of your time if you're interested in home theater. So. <laughs> and, and that's where I would go back to this idea of the certified system. So as you mm -hmm. said, again, we don't necessarily have a, an open door policy. People can just come to Northridge and hear this, but that's why those integrators and retailers around the country that have invested in a brand, they do have the showrooms that are available for you to come mm -hmm. in and see, and they're dotted across the country. So those are first and foremost, the people that you want to contact to go see and hear a system because we don't sell or install systems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just merely have that as a reference system that's available for us here in the Northridge campus. But that's where you would first start uh, is with your local integrator and go to them, talk to them about what you want to create, have a listen to the system that they have in their showroom and then right. uh, start the process there. And that goes for the entire line of the Harman luxury products. All of it's sold through integrators and retailers, but some of it's also sold online. Correct. Uh, there are a number of our partners that do sell our products online. So depending on where you're at in the country, you know, find your local retailer and see if they've got an online presence. But some of the bigger uh, regional players or national players do have our products available uh, for you to, to see and hear. All right. Well, we went way over our time, but I want to close with my one of my favorite closing questions is what is your definition of audiophile nirvana? <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. That's an interesting question. So I, for me, one of the things about this role that I'm in, um, I've been a musician my entire life. I just, I live and breathe music. Uh, so for me, this is a, uh, the perfect job in that respect. Nirvana to me is being in the moment with the music uh, as someone that, you know, creates content and play shows uh, with live music events on a regular basis, you know what that experience is like. And it's uh, um, music is just something that gets in your blood. It, it can affect and change your emotions. You know, if you're, you want to get jazzed and pumped up because you're working out you listen to more aggressive music or something like that. If you're sad, maybe you're listening to more melancholy stuff. If you're in a, a mood of remembrance, you're going to go back to specific songs that were, that was a song at our wedding. That was the song we used to listen to in high school, hanging out with our friends. There's those things that are going to draw you back to it. So to me, the, the Nirvana part of all of that is just that experience of the music of where it takes you emotionally, um, how it makes you feel, how it makes you move, you dance, you sing, mm -hmm. you, you think about people, uh, you have these great memories. And from a, from a product side, that's what we're in the business to do is to bring that experience to as many people as possible. However you listen to music, wherever you listen to music, 
uh, how loud do you want to play it? Do you want to take it outdoors? Do you want it in your car? That's uh, that's what we do is just make it available anywhere and everywhere at the highest possible quality. And I, I love the fact that we can do that. Uh, music is it's in my blood. So. All right. I'm well, excited. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Uh, this was a, an incredible deep dive into Harmon Luxury Audio. I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who's listening to remember to subscribe, like, comment, uh, wherever you are, and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Thank you.